Welcome to Crime, Corruption, and Cocktails, the true crime podcast where we look at cases of corruption and negligence and examine their historical and cultural implications. Today, I'm drinking a vodka and club soda. What are you having, Jenny? I'm drinking a rum and coke, and in this episode, we're taking a look at the tragic story of the Radium Girls. Let's start with a background into radium. So radium is an element that was discovered in 1898 by a scientist Marie Curie and her husband Pierre. Radium was considered magical and after it was discovered that radium could kill cancer cells, it became marketed as a cure for everything from depression to impotence. Radium was in everything from tonic water to cosmetics. Its lumosity was a huge draw as well. American William J. Hammer mixed the element with zinc sulfide and glue and created a glow-in-the-dark paint. The paint was very popular in Europe and came to America in 1914 when the U.S. Radium Corporation bought Hammer's invention. The company was given U.S. military contracts and radium was used during World War I to make the dials on machines and soldiers' watches glow. Watches with similar properties were also fashionable with the public. Radium was one of the most expensive materials on earth and one of the most profitable. Factories making these watches and military materials sprung up around the country. Young women and girls were hired at these factories to hand paint watch dials for soldiers and instrument panels for military equipment. It was believed that women were more capable of this job because of their small hands. The women were happy to be helping with the war efforts and holding down the home front while men fought in the war. Dial painters were paid better than the average factory worker at the time, which made the work lucrative and allowed the women to gain financial independence. The work was also viewed as artistic, which also made it a draw. The dial painters mixed glue, water, and radium powder into a luminous paint. They'd carefully use a camel hair brush to apply the dial numbers. After a few strokes, the brushes would lose their shape and the women couldn't paint accurately. To get the numbers on the watches small enough and the details exact, workers were told to use a technique called lip pointing, which involved putting the tip of the paintbrush between their lips to sharpen the point. Workers would paint between 100 to 200 dials a day. Daily exposure from the radium dust caused the workers' clothes, skin, and hair to glow. Because of this, workers received the nickname the quote-unquote ghost girls. It was common for the women to show up to work in their best dresses since the fabric would shine when they went dancing after work. Some even applied the paint to their teeth because it gave them radiant smiles. Any worker who questioned the radium powder safety would always be assured that there was nothing to worry about and that the radium was in fact healthy for them. The dangers of radium were not yet known to the public, but the scientific community was aware. While working with radium, Marie Curie was burned, blinded, and suffering from anemia before she eventually died from radium poisoning. Radium was especially dangerous with repeated exposure and ingestion. It would later be discovered that radium is radioactive and has a half-life of 1,600 years. So once the radium was in someone's body, as it was with the radium girls, it was there to stay. Effects of radium poisoning do not show immediately, but within several years, the health of many factory workers began declining. While the young women had no knowledge of radium's risks, male scientists and executives working in the same factories as them did, and they made efforts to protect themselves. One of the first known factory workers to die was Amelia Molly Maggia, who was a doll painter for the U.S. Radium Corporation, then known as Radium Luminous Materials Corporation in Orange, New Jersey. Molly began suffering from toothaches that required her teeth to be removed. Ulcers filled with pus that bled would develop where her pulled teeth had once been. Her jaw swelled, her body ached, and she was unable to walk. A doctor believed she was suffering from rheumatism and was prescribed aspirin. Her health was so bad she had to quit her job. During one examination in 1922, Molly's jaw crumbled and parts of it fell off when her dentist attempted to remove a tooth. This ailment would later be known as radium jaw. Molly died several days later due to hemorrhage at the age of 24 and her cause of death was listed as syphilis. Her body was later exhumed and her bones were proven to be highly radioactive. 
According to NPR, by the mid-1920s, doll painters were falling ill by the dozen and became afflicted with horrific diseases and ailments, including anemia, broken bones, migraines, tumors, shortened or lost limbs, stillbirths, rotted jaw bones, and collapsed spines. Doctors in areas surrounding the factories dealt with countless patients dealing with the same symptoms and ailments, and they suspected if their cases could be related. Many of the women were no longer employed at the radium factories when their symptoms began, so they were not able to immediately link their pain to their work. For two years, the U.S. Radium Corporation denied any connection between the girls' deaths and their work at the factory. Facing a downturn in business because of the growing controversy, the company finally commissioned an independent study of the matter, which concluded that the painters had died from the effects of radium exposure. Refusing to accept the report's findings, the company commissioned additional studies that came to a different conclusion. In 1920, a male employee of the U.S. Radium Corporation died, and the company finally took a serious look at their employees' health. Pathologist Harrison Martlin was hired by Essex County, New Jersey officials to investigate whether or not radium was to blame. Martlin created a test that proved conclusively that radium had poisoned the doll painters by destroying their bodies from the inside. The radium ate away at their bones and caused them to honeycomb. The radium industry tried to discredit Martlin's findings and the workers claimed, but the women themselves fought back. Grace Fryer worked as a doll painter alongside Molly from 1917 to 1920. In 1922, her teeth were falling out and she experienced jaw abscesses. Her bones were decaying and one doctor suggested that they may be related to her time in the doll factory. In 1925, Fryer and five other employees, including two of Molly's sisters, sued the U.S. Radium Corporation. She she struggled to find a lawyer that was prepared to help her as many lawyers she approached were intimidated by taking on a large corporation. The women also faced a setback with the two-year statute of limitation from the time of poisoning. In 1927, the five women filed their case. The media and public fiercely supported the women and nicknamed them the Radium Girls. Testimony began in early 1928 and the U.S. Radium Corporation was given an adjournment until September which caused public backlash. The women's attorney alleged that U.S. Radium's misrepresentation of scientific opinion and campaign of misinformation was the reason that the women were not informed and did not take legal action within the statute of limitations. With not much longer to live, the five women eventually accepted an out-of-court settlement with the company of $10,000 each and a $600 a year stipend. None of them survived more than two years after the settlement, but they wanted their legal case to serve as an example for other women and girls in the profession. The U.S. Radium Corporation fought other lawsuits before eventually going out of business in the 1930s. Thanks to the efforts of the New Jersey Radium Girls, more dial painters learned of their occupational health hazards. A group of women in Ottawa, Illinois, sued their employer, the Radium Dial Company, in 1935. At the forefront of their case was dial painter Catherine Wolf Donahue. Donahue was suffering from a grape-sized tumor on her hip due to radium poisoning and had seen a number of her co-workers die. The Radium Dial Company denied any responsibility and lied about medical tests the company had paid for. The company went so far to cover up the truth that they edited employees' autopsies and stole their bones to hide any evidence of radium poisoning. Again, the workers faced setbacks with the statute of limitations and struggled to find a lawyer. Their hearings before the Illinois Industrial Commission finally began in July 1937. By then, the Radium Dial Company's Ottawa factory was closed. Donahue was so sick that she collapsed during a hearing and she was forced to share her testimony from her deathbed. Donahue's courage and fight for justice won many people over. The factory workers eventually won their case, and Donahue died on July 27, 1938. She thankfully lived long enough to see the Radium Dial Company's first appeal get denied. Finally, in 1939, the U.S. Supreme Court denied the company's final appeal and upheld the lower court's decision. 
In addition to compensation for the survivors, the victims' death certificates were updated to show their actual cause of death. However, much of their compensation, if it was received, was used to pay for medical bills or even their own funerals. When a stipend was awarded, many did not live long enough to collect their award. After the trial ended, the Ottawa factory survivors found themselves shunned by their community. A lawsuit took place during the Great Depression when work was hard to come by, and many felt that the women and girls should have kept their experiences to themselves. During World War II, many survivors were voluntarily studied by scientists in order to explore the effects of radioactivity. Even after the women's deaths, their remains continue to emit radioactivity. Some women were buried in lead coffins to protect the surrounding environment. The land that both the New Jersey and Illinois factories were built on was contaminated by radium. According to the authors of the book Weird New Jersey, the EPA began efforts to clean up the area of the former New Jersey factory in the 1990s, and in 1991, 237 Orange, New Jersey residents collected $4.2 million from the remains of the U.S. Radium Corporation. In 1938, the U.S. Food and Drug Administration banned the quote-unquote deceptive packaging of radium-based products. Safety practices surrounding radium were put in place because of the radium girls, and the radium watches were still being made until 1968. Though the exact number of women whose health was affected by ingesting radium is not known, it's estimated that thousands of women suffered. Though many experienced more immediate symptoms of radium poisoning and death, some did not show effects until later in life. The last known radium girl to die was Mae Keene, who passed away at the age of 107 in 2014. Keene only worked for a short period of time at a Connecticut factory and was asked if she wanted to quit because she did not enjoy the practice of lip pointing. The Radium Girl's legacy continues on today. In January 2022, the Horological Society of New York announced the Grace Fryer Scholarship for female watchmaking students. Catherine Wolf Donahue's personal scrapbook is on display at Northwestern University in Illinois, and the town of Ottawa, Illinois built a memorial statue to honor all of the radium dial painting victims. Del, had you heard about this case before, and what are your general thoughts after just talking about it? So I hadn't heard of this case before. Obviously, I heard of Marie and the fact that she died from radium poisoning, but I didn't realize the score of radium poisoning until after listening and talking about this case. I think, quite frankly, it's one of the more disgusting examples of misogyny and the fact that the males made sure that they protected themselves but didn't extend those same protections to the females is, quite frankly, just horrifying. It's good that there was some justice in this case, but obviously when it comes to the actual impact of the justice, it's more so the impact on future generations and the fact that we got things like radium cleanups and the ban on deceptive packaging when it comes to radium versus the justice actually going to the people who directly suffered because unfortunately they, for the most part, died before they were able to really see out the justice. That's why it's so great to hear that Donovan was able to live long enough to see that first appeal denied and the fact that the company wasn't able to get away with the crappy and very illegal things that they were doing. What are your thoughts on this case? It's really upsetting to me. I was definitely getting annoyed and (laughs) emotional researching this, especially just hearing about how hard these women fought. And it's really cool to see that these women were very selfless. The women in New Jersey, they wanted other women to be safe. They knew this was an issue and they knew that they were not the only ones affected by it. And they did end up inspiring other people. Like you said, it just reeks of misogyny just how disposable these women really were to their employer. They didn't care about them because they knew they could hire someone else and just continue the cycle of killing these women. And I'm sure when these women started to fight against them, they were not worried at all. I know that the public was really starting to mistrust the radium company in New Jersey, at least, and they were really standing by the girls. But I think they probably were confident that were these like big executive men, why is anyone going to believe these? factory working women compared to us but the women did have some advocates in their lives too their doctors especially that dentist that molly magia was working with because i think he saw a few other people and was like what the hell is going on like this is not normal i can't even imagine the pain that she experienced and that all these poor women experienced
experienced horrible ways to die. There is a book called The Radium Girls if anyone is interested in reading more about the girls and the author has a website. She has some profiles of specific women that were involved in these cases. Catherine Donahue is on there and I think Grace Fryer is on there too. So you get to learn a little bit more about who the women were which I think is really interesting and really important. Do you think we'll see another kind of workplace tragedy like this again? So a part of me wants to say no, because and we're going to talk about OSHA shortly. I think that we have systems in place to prevent this from happening. But on the other hand, capitalism is something that always finds a way to mess with its workers and find ways to make workers' lives harder. So I wouldn't be surprised if we see another tragedy like this again. It may not be on the same scale, but since corporations are willing to gamble with people's lives, I think that we can't completely rule it out. I think that the closest thing we've seen to that recently was with COVID-19. And if you look at the factory workers and the factory three farm workers and how sick they were getting and their increased likelihood of dying from COVID-19 because the companies were ignoring the health risks. What do you think? I agree. I definitely think we're going to see something. I don't know what field or like sector it would technically be in. That's the COVID-19 thing with the factory farm workers is a great example. I wanted to say too that there are some professions that are higher risk that do employ more women. The garment workers in Bangladesh, this is a little different than the radium girls, but we've seen so many like fires and building collapses because no one is taking care of these workers. And it's devastating. I think stuff like that is definitely going to continue because it's profits over people, right? This is the definition of profits over people, the radium girls. And I don't know if that'll really ever change. That's really what capitalism is all about. And I feel like it's kind of getting worse. So with that being said, let's get into some legislation that the story of the radium girls helps enact. So the Radium Girls was one of the first times a company was considered responsible for their workers' health. Their story helped to later create OSHA, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration in the United States. In December 1970, President Richard Nixon signed the Occupational Health and Safety Act into law. This act authorized the formation of OSHA, which opened in April 1971. OSHA's goal is to assure employers provide safe and helpful conditions for working men and women free of recognized hazards by setting and enforcing standards and providing training, outreach, education, and technical assistance. According to its website, OSHA establishes and enforces standards, provides outreach, compliance, assistance, and training, and establishes cooperative programs to partner and work collaboratively with employers, employees, and other stakeholders. These intervention strategies are designed to deter, assist, and collaborate with employers and employees to reduce workplace injuries, illnesses, and fatalities. Its first issued workplace standards provided workers protections from asbestos. In the 1980s, OSHA standards gave workers the right to know what chemicals they may be exposed to at their workplace. They then went on to provide stricter standards for falls, bloodborne pathogens, and toxic substances. Bloodborne pathogens practices were created in response to the AIDS epidemic. This is why healthcare workers wear gloves when drawing blood and why there are special deposit boxes to dispose of needles. In more recent years, they produced standards for various chemicals, construction sites, and COVID-19. The agency has also created trainings for workplace safety and has whistleblower protections for employees that speak out against their workplace. OSHA ensures that workers have a right to a safe and healthy workplace. Before OSHA's creation, disabling work injuries had increased 20% during the 1960s, and 14,000 workers were dying on the job each year. Worker deaths in America are down on average from about 38 worker deaths a day in 1970 to 15 a day in 2019. Worker injuries and illnesses are down from 10.9 incidents per 100 workers in 1972 to 2.8 per 100 in 2019. However, the agency is very understaffed and 
and nationwide, there are issues of underreporting and racial disparities at unsafe jobs. So like we had talked about, radium was really a miracle product when it was discovered. And we learned as scientific community and as the public that radium was not as safe and healthy as we thought it was. And that, of course, is not the only product in world history where people thought it was really safe when it was truly killing us. We'll go through a short list of a few others. The first is asbestos, like we mentioned with OSHA. Asbestos is a heat-resistant mineral used in manufacturing. It's most widely known to harm the lungs and cause mesothelioma, a fatal cancer. The first cases of asbestos-related illnesses were recorded in 1924 in the British Medical Journal. As a result, the British government enacted regulations on dust to protect factory workers. However, in the United States, use of the fiber peaked in popularity around World War II. Asbestos has been used in building insulation, brake shoes for cars, adhesives, garden supplies, and even crayons. So almost anything you can think of. Knowledge about asbestosis and lung cancer began spreading by the 1940s and by the mid-1950s, scientists determined that there was likely a strong link between asbestos and lung cancer. In the 1970s, the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, the CPSC, banned asbestos in some home building materials. In 1989, the EPA banned the use of asbestos in new materials and called for all school buildings to be inspected and repaired if necessary. Though asbestos use has dropped, exposure can still occur and be very dangerous to the human body. Another example are tapeworms. In the 1950s, people began infecting themselves with tapeworms by swallowing a pill that had a tapeworm egg inside of it in order to lose weight. People thought that since tapeworms were a parasite and they fed off the foods that you ate, meaning your calories would be split between you and the tapeworms. Though you may lose weight, tapeworms can cause abdominal pain, diarrhea, bacterial infections, and neurological issues. Death can even occur with a tapeworm diet. Despite the risk, people still use the tapeworm diet as a way to lose weight. The final example that we're going to talk about is that of cigarettes and tobacco. Tobacco has been around for hundreds of years and was long thought to be beneficial to someone's health. People even use tobacco enemas and tobacco toothpaste. Cigarettes were introduced to America in the 19th century. In the 20th century, cigarettes were prescribed by doctors for lung problems, headaches, nerves, and more. Women were even told to smoke while pregnant. People often smoked in any public place that they wanted. Then, in the 1950s, smoking cigarettes was linked to lung cancer and later other health issues. Now, many countries have bans on smoking indoors and in public places. Cigarette packages also feature health warnings and sometimes graphic imagery showing the harmful effects of smoking. That wraps up this week's case. Thank you for listening. Let us know in the comments what you think about the case of the Radium Girls. You can read more about this case and how to support us in the links below. We will be back next week with a brand new episode focused on Ted Bundy. As always, stay safe. Thank you.